Welcome to Fundraising Stories with Female Founders. I'm Julia Elliott-Brown, the founder and CEO of Enter the Arena. I'm a serial entrepreneur and an expert in raising investment and business growth. Our mission at Enter the Arena is to empower female founders to fly through pre-raise and investment and onto the exponential growth of their business with investment expertise and business coaching. Here we share the stories of inspirational female founders who've raised investment to inspire you to do the same. You'll hear their honest accounts of what it was really like to secure funding, the highs, the lows, and the challenges they experienced on the journey. And along the way, we'll discuss top tips for how you can be successful too. Today, I'm excited to be speaking with Emily from Oddbox. Now, Oddbox is London's first wonky fruit and veg subscription box service. This is a business that's all about reducing food waste by sourcing slightly imperfect produce direct from farms and delivering it to consumers in a box. And the subscription box that Oddbox offers are around 30% cheaper than other similar services. And to top it all, 10% of the produce that Oddbox have gets donated to charities that fight food poverty. So it's a business with a real mission and not only a mission to stop us from wasting food, but also to get people to embrace imperfection, which I love. Emily co-founded Oddbox in 2016 after a strong career in finance and operations in the private and public sectors. And in summer 2018, Emily raised her first external investment round of 530,000 pounds via crowdfunding so today we're going to be finding out all about Emily's fundraising journey, the highs, the lows, the challenges, and her top tips on how to be successful. Welcome, Emily. Um, it's great to have you here. Please do tell us all about how you came up with the idea for Oddbox. Hi, Julia, and thanks so much for inviting me today uh, to share my journey and also to help other female founders in their journey into uh, fundraising. So basically, the initial idea for Hotbox came when we were traveling to Portugal. And there, when you go to the local market, you see all these amazing fruit and veg, with, which don't really look cosmetically appealing, but taste so much better than what you get in the UK. And then here in the UK, you get everything all year round. Everything looks perfect, but it doesn't really taste of anything. And so uh, I, uh, being, uh, being French and having lived in India before that, it's, uh, it was something which shocked me quite a lot when I came to the UK. And so at that time, I then started doing some research. And that's when I realized what was happening in the industry and the extent of food waste that was created due to criteria that supermarkets were pushing on the producers. And uh, um, at the same time, there was a campaign run by uh, a French supermarket, Intermarché, on uh, ugly fruit and veg. And so I thought, uh, oh, that's amazing. I'd love to buy ugly fruit and veg in the UK. But there was nothing like that. And so I thought, uh, so uh, I'm definitely keen to uh, or happy to buy ugly fruit and veg i knew my friends would be as well and so i had always thought at some point i'd love to start my own business and having worked uh, in the charity sector it was important for me to do something which was uh, purpose driven and so um, basically it was kind of the perfect idea uh, at the perfect time I love it. And let's not call this these poor fruit and vegetable ugly. They're not ugly. They're just perfect <laughs> in their own way. <laughs> so, so tell me a bit more about how you funded the business at the start of the journey. Yes. So uh, from the start, basically, we were revenue generating because when we uh, when we it wasn't massive, but uh, we put uh, a bit of our own money, and uh, um, then we just. Uh, uh, were uh, and the good thing about uh, the fruit and veg industry is that uh, we had uh, payment terms where we were paying our supplier with uh, uh, at the start uh, seven days after we were getting the produce and uh, now we're paying our suppliers with 30 days payment term and because uh, we run it as a subscription business we get uh, our uh, customers pay upfront before they get their box. So in terms of cash flow, that really helped. And basically we kind of, uh, whatever small profit we were making, we would reinvest that in the business. 
So it was really kind of uh, trying to do everything on the shoestring. At the start, we were packing the boxes in a local church that we were getting for free. We would deliver the boxes ourselves, pack them ourselves. So we didn't have major expenses. And as we grew, we then moved to a slightly bigger warehouse. We hired our first intern, and that's kind of uh, the money that we got. That's, that's we would great. reinvest it in the business. That's great. And I think that's something that other entrepreneurs should learn from, that you can be quite clever in your creative terms yeah. to, to, to manage your cash flow. And that's yes. kind of what you did. And, did, um, and in those early days, then, did you have to kind of sacrifice your own salary to be able to, to, to fund the business without going to invest? So, so basically, uh, so I am. Uh, uh, so at the start, I started the business and I was still working at that time. So, um, and my husband had left his job. And so I co-founded the business with my husband. So he had left his job and wasn't, was working on something else, uh, another idea, which uh, was fine, but didn't uh, really have as much traction. And so he kind of uh, very early on joined Outbox. And so we were able to manage because I, uh, uh, I was still working full time um, for the first one and a half year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so amazing. A husband and wife team. So you're pretty much yes. throwing everything into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, it's, I think it's good to start by uh, bootstrapping because it makes you um, kind of, uh, if you have money up front, then it's easy to spend money. Uh, when you don't have that money, you need to be very creative and come up with very smart ways of doing, thi doing things. So basically, we uh, one thing that now... Um, we're really happy with is we are doing the deliveries overnight and that means that it's a lot faster it's that so there's less kind of um, uh, carbon emissions so it's good for the environment but it's also uh, faster and therefore cheaper for us to run so it makes sense both as a financial and as an environmental decision Yes, that's absolutely right. The less money you have, the more creative you can be. Yes, yes. And that's a classic kind of lean startup approach, which I think is, is great. And also investors really like to see that you've been hustling and, and really yeah. making good use of the money you had. So, so how, at what point did you decide then that you wanted to raise some money to grow the business? So basically it was through having discussions with, uh, with people, we never thought uh, when we started it that we would need to raise investment. Our background wasn't uh, in startups. So my background is in finance, but more of uh, corporate finance. And my husband's background is in uh, banking. So uh, we, it yes, it wasn't something that, uh, because we were revenue generating, we thought we'll be able to grow organically. And uh, uh, talking to people, talking to other uh, startup uh, owners we thought we can really accelerate our growth if we raise investment and we realized that there was we were getting quite a lot of traction that we were not able to expand geographically as fast as we could because we couldn't move into a bigger warehouse we could because we couldn't make a certain investment so it's just been talking to people and realizing that um uh, in fact, it's not necessarily that difficult to raise investment when you have a good idea and when you have traction. Mm. And so it was a real kind of mindset shift that we got at the beginning of this year that, uh, yes, uh, it's possible for us to raise a significant amount of investment. And so tell me a bit about the traction, because it's a really quite a touchy subject, I think, where entrepreneurs know that they have to get to a certain amount of traction before they can go out for investment but what traction means is is often quite difficult to define how far where have you got to by the time you went out to raise investment yes yeah, so uh, so basically we had some so i think it's it's a certain number of uh, customers uh, and I think it's it very much depends and you don't necessarily need to have too much traction. It could be kind of uh, interesting discussions or uh, future traction. Uh, 
but it also depends who you speak to because some people will want a certain level of uh, traction and some people will be happy with uh, a lower level of traction depending on how interested they are in the space and i think at the start we were not talking to the right investors we were talking to people who had invested in tech businesses and they were telling us yes you don't have enough traction it's not scalable as a business it's very operational and uh, and therefore but in fact, they would never have invested in a business like Oddbox because they would invest only in tech businesses. But for us, we took that as um, them telling us, you don't have enough traction, come back later. Um, and that's only when we started talking to the right investors that we realized we didn't need that level of traction. But I... Uh, I, I think it's also because um, in 2016, we grew from 60 to 600 customers. And in January, uh, sorry, in 2017, in January 2018 alone, we had 400 additional customers. So we really, and same in February. So in 2018, um, end of 17, we had some uh, quite a lot of press. We did a lot of local markets and that generated a lot of traction in early 2018. And basically that's, that huge growth in the early part of 2018 was enough to show that there was potential because it was very accelerated growth. Yes. So you, so it's not just about the absolute level of traction, but it's about the momentum. Yes. Yes. It's, it's very much about the momentum. About that momentum. But it's interesting. Um, you know, if that you say it's sometimes you're not talking, if you want to talk to the right investors, you get the wrong message back. And I think yeah. it's something that is an easy mistake to make when you're new to the startup world, isn't it? That you go out and talk to lots of the wrong type of people and that can be quite frustrating. Yes. But in the end, you decided to go for crowdfunding. So what was it that made you do that? Yes, so initially we were not planning to do crowdfunding. And in fact, when we spoke to other um, startups who had raised through crowdfunding, they told us that it takes a lot of time to do a crowdfunding campaign and that in terms of brand awareness, uh, it's not necessarily uh, kind of the best platform because mostly investors are male. And when your uh, customer base is female, you're not really kind of uh, uh, targeting the right people. And but uh, uh, so uh, and so for us, it was always uh, let's go for uh, angel investment. But while working with uh, uh, a fundraising uh, uh, consultant who helped us with our uh, kind of uh, angel raise, uh, he said, why don't you, because you're a subscription business, uh, your customers are very engaged, you know them very well, why don't you ask them whether they would be interested in investing? And so we sent a very short survey to our customers and we got 20% of our customers saying that they would be interested in investing. And so it, uh, uh, overall, it, uh, we thought we would be able to raise between 100 and 300,000 just from our customers. And so uh, it, that's when we realized that uh, potentially crowdfunding is a good way because it engages our customers. It makes them even more involved in the business. And that would be a pretty easy raise uh, considering that uh, so many of them were already keen to invest. That's incredible. And so, did, and so when, you, when you did your crowdfunding campaign, did you go out to those customers before you went public with the campaign and get them to commit in advance? Yes, yeah, so so we had already raised half of that uh, from uh, angels because you probably know, but uh, uh, you can't uh, do uh, crowdfunding uh, unless you have at least uh, 40 to 60 percent committing, the, depending on the uh, business you're in and what you want to raise. So we had already 40 percent committed. And then we did two days of private round when where we opened it to our customers. And so uh, we, that's why our raise was pretty quick because a lot of our customers then invested at that time and all along the campaign. And we kept on engaging them, sending them email. We put a letter in our boxes every week. So they knew about the crowdfunding campaign uh, way in advance. Yeah, so crowdfunding is great if you have that kind of tribe of followers, isn't it? Yes, yes. Otherwise, uh, it's it can be... Uh, very time consuming and very stressful because it's not uh, as easy as what people might think. And so tell me about the angel investors that you secured. How, how many angel investors did you have? 
how much did you raise from the angels in total and how did you find the angel investors to come in yes so um so we raised um, 250,000 from angels and then 270 from the through crowdfunding and so uh, one there's one person that we met at a pitch event which was organized uh, which was for food businesses so organized by uh, a magazine which is for food services and so um then we just had a conversation with her and then a follow-up of conversation and she was interested in investing and then the other investors we met uh, using clearly so so clearly so is an uh, um, angel network for social businesses so uh, they and uh, they have uh, um, a huge number of angel investors in their network and they have a pitch event every month and for us it was very much aligned because it's angels who want to invest in businesses who have a social purpose and so we um, then have uh, five four more investors through clearly so fantastic so you had a lead angel investor you got four more angel investors through the yeah. network and then you got the final 50% through crowdfunding so really yeah. nicely structured round um, and yeah. what but what did you find to be the biggest challenges then in, in achieving that um, I think it's the time it takes we um, especially uh, to go to all these pitching events uh, you need to apply at least uh, one or two months in advance so uh, it's very much all the planning that it takes uh, and we did other pitching events where uh, um, we didn't secure anything, but it takes a lot of time. Um, plus, uh, there's lots of, uh, it's quite competitive, so you won't be selected for all of them. And even after you pitch, um, so we had, at clearly, so we had a very uh, successful pitch. We had lots of people interested in the room. And then there's lots of angels who can't attend in the room, but uh, will uh, contact you later on we thought that would go a lot faster so we got um, two people after the pitch event uh, which who expressed interest and the discussion went uh, uh, relatively fast and then it kind of stalled a bit um, because obviously people have other things to do it's not necessarily their priority uh, but closer to uh, starting the crowdfunding campaign these discussions accelerated a bit more because I think people knew that uh, um, they might miss the opportunity if uh, they didn't uh, um, they didn't have uh, kind of, uh, they didn't progress or have the discussions with uh, us uh, faster. And, so, and how long did it take in total to do the round? So, uh, so we started in February 2018, just kind of uh, uh, starting with doing our business plan, our pitch decks, and we. Uh, did the crowdfunding in July, so uh, six months. Six months, okay. So, I mean, normally a round takes around three to six months, so I think yeah. that's, even though it probably felt like a never-ending process to <laughs> at the time, I think that's, that is fairly typical. So. Yeah. Yes, so it's, it's just for people to know that uh, it can even take uh, longer, and, uh, um, and we uh, had to ask one of the angel investors to do uh, an advanced subscription agreement uh, so that we could uh, uh, start spending some of the funds uh, because also with crowdfunding it then takes a bit of time to do all the uh, negotiate all the legal documentation and then for the release of the fund so we got all the fund most of the funds released only in august so it's mm -hmm. for people to understand that uh, uh, once it's committed if all that uh, you don't necessarily get all of the funds uh, and you need to have everybody uh, kind of uh, secured before you can get uh, all the funds yeah i mean it's such a challenging time isn't it you're going out raising finance and you have to wait right until the end to get the money yes. yeah so that's a very clever idea to get that advanced subscription um, and something i think other entrepreneurs should should look at whether they can do that and advance kind of yeah. learn on the money which is yeah. really I mean, what, what do you think you would do differently if you could kind of go back now to the beginning of 2018? What would you do differently? Yes, I, I think we, uh, we could have done uh, more work in 2017 or uh, before we thought about, uh, about fundraising uh, in terms of building our network 
and um, talking to investors, identifying investors much more uh, early on, or at least identifying the networks who had inv invested in the space. Because what we did as well um, is we kind of started looking on LinkedIn uh, who had invested in similar companies in the food waste space. And that's kind of the person that uh, you want to be in uh, relationship with before you need to ask for the money and not at the time when you need to ask. Mm -hmm. So it's about building that network, going to investor events, uh, going to so the crowdfunding platforms have regular events which are open to the public or at least open to people who are registered as investors on their platform that um, anybody can attend and so it's good to network up front yes you're right although having said that that can be very time consuming yes as well. yes yeah i would say as well it's uh, um, a good advice is to talk to a lot of other startups um, who've raised investment to understand what they've done, um, who they pitched to, how they found their investors, whether. So uh, we got lots of tips from other startups on um, kind of which events we should go to, where we could pitch uh, and how to go about it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, it's very important to kind of try and shortcut things if you can yeah. by getting advice from people who can tell you what to do. <laughs> so yes, yeah. Sure. And so now you had a you achieved a valuation of 1.6 million which i think is actually pretty good yeah um which means you gave away about 18 percent of the company which again is you know a reasonable amount to give away on a first round how do you feel about that valuation now do you think it was good do you think you could have got more at, at the time we thought it was uh, uh, a good valuation that uh, um, because we were quite early stage and people had told us you don't have that much traction uh, now looking at what other companies have raised and the kind of valuations that they've achieved, I think we could have gone for more than that. But then uh, it's uh, hindsight. So uh, always when you've done it, you think, yes, uh, we could have had a higher valuation. Uh, I think, the, uh, yes, we were quite conservative in terms of what we went for as valuation if we were doing it again maybe we would push it a bit higher but then at the same time when you want to raise again later you need to be a bit careful about the kind of valuation that you have at the start because you can't uh, have a lower valuation in your second round so uh, it's very much uh, you need to make sure that you deliver uh, the traction that you've promised to your investors so that you can uh, in your second raise, you can ask for that higher valuation. Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about how much value you're going to create in the business in the long term and the ultimate amount of equity that you get left. So yeah. I think people get quite hung up on this, how much my valuation was on the first round. And actually, you're right. If you, if you go too high on your valuation now, it makes it more difficult for future rounds. So it's a fine balance. It's not straightforward. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, female entrepreneurs. Obviously, yeah. you're, you're a co-founder. You have the business with your husband. So you're yeah. a, 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 a man and a woman together, which is yes. good. But what, what's your view on how we can get more women um, out there raising the money they need to scale? Um, I, I think... So uh, first of all, being a sole founder is not necessarily easy. And we felt that uh, uh, being co-founders really helped, uh, even in terms of having the discussions with the investors, because there are sometimes some tricky questions that uh, one person will feel more comfortable answering than the other person. Um, and also investors like to know that uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a team and it's not only one person. Uh, but uh, yes, I think lots of investors are uh, preconceptions uh, about what women can uh, do uh, and uh, issues of uh, potentially the person might go at, uh, on maternity leave at some point and uh, things like that and not being as committed. And most of the, the investors are still male. So uh, it's still a very much male dominated industry. Um, so it's it's important to have groups of female investors who back female entrepreneurs. I think it's also important for uh, us as female entrepreneurs to help 
uh, other entrepreneurs who are going through the same journey. Mm, I couldn't agree more. And, and actually, with the investors that you got on board, both the angels and the, and the people who came through crowdfunding, do you know what the mix is, the gender mix? Um, I haven't checked, but in terms of our, uh, um, our angel investors, uh, it's uh, four male and one female. Um, but in terms of the crowdfunding, we, uh, I haven't checked. I think it might be a bit more balanced, but it's probably still more uh, male than female. Mm, that's it. And, that, uh, and your customer base, is that? That's uh, 85% female. Right, that's interesting. So I think it'd be very interesting for you to go and have a have a yeah. look at yes mm. yes I'll have a look. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. So what what's the kind of what top advice would you give then to other women who are going out there to raise finance? So uh, I would say get uh, some professional advice. It's always good to get uh, a proper fundraising uh, consultant like yourself to support because then in t for us in terms of getting the templates for our business plan, our pitch deck, knowing what to include, what not to include, it was really help helpful in terms of the process, which are the uh, pitch event that uh, we should attend, then I would say talk to a lot of people who've raised, um, who've raised money, so both uh, female and non-female, to understand what they've gone through, who, uh, how they found their investors, uh, and also make sure that you look for investors who invested in similar companies and in the similar space. We didn't talk to that many investors in our case we were quite focused in terms of the investors that we wanted and we didn't attend uh, too many events so it was it wasn't like uh, um, meetings after meetings after meetings that we attended and going to any event uh, for seven seven days a week we, we were quite targeted and i think that uh, that's probably a better way of doing it than trying to target everyone yeah, I totally agree. So it's a, a laser focused approach, knowing who yeah. knowing who, who you would like to have on board for investors, getting the right support and advice on getting uh, investment ready in all your documents yeah. and also knowing where to find the investors and how to approach them, whether it's pitch events, whether it's your customers, whether it's angel networks, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so final question. What yeah. is next then, Emily, for Oddbox? What are you going to be doing next? And also, do you think you're going to need to raise investment again to grow the business further? Yeah, so I think once you've raised, uh, you're kind of now in the uh, mindset of, uh, yes, we'll need to raise again uh, because uh, the money goes uh, fast. So once you have money, it goes, it goes fast um, because you start recruiting a bigger team. Uh, you need to make investment in marketing, in uh, oper increasing your operational capacity. So for us, um, it's about expanding to the rest of London in the next uh, 12 to 15 months. And then we want to go nationwide, so to tier two cities, um, and potentially uh, look at whether we can replicate and franchise our model in mainland, mainland Europe. We're also um, kind of in discussion with some of our growers to look at more of a tech solution because there's very limited visibility in terms of what is surplus and imperfect in the market at farm level. And we think there could be uh, a solution of a B2B tech marketplace where we bring visibility on what's available and therefore food and beverage companies, hotel restaurants can get access to this uh, imperfect and surplus produce. Fantastic. That's very exciting plans yes. to see. Yeah. And um, I wish you all the very best, Emily, with making the world wonky. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot, Julia. And thanks a lot for the opportunity to share my story. Thank you for sharing your story. Thanks a lot. Thanks for following Fundraising Stories with Female Founders. This content is all provided to you for free. So if you've enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe so you never miss another one. Enter the Arena has helped hundreds of female founders fly through pre-raise and investment and onto the exponential growth of their business. Our first-hand experience, expert guidance and proven programs help female founders unleash the Wonder Woman inside. 
to see if we can help you do the same, head over to www.entertheArena.co.uk. I'm Julia Elliott-Brown and I look forward to talking with you soon.